Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Ian Malloy. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Jiang Zhang. Uh, we're from IBM Research, and we're very excited to actually uh, come to you and talk to you about a project that we've been working on for a while called the Code Genome, and this is for fingerprinting code to build trustworthy SBOMs. So one thing that we've probably all done is open up a terminal, typed foo install bar, where foo could be anything from pip to app, yum, et cetera, and installed software, and not necessarily really thought about whether or not we could trust that software where it came from. And a lot of the times the software, you know, it might be signed, you know, with some certificate, so you have some form of authenticity. It might list the dependencies that it has. Uh, typically, this is just so that it can install and run correctly, and it can install those dependencies. But we really don't know if we can actually trust it. And so I think we're going to be about the, at least the third person today to mention Ken Thompson's seminal paper on reflection. The fifth. Oh, okay. So we've missed some. So uh, everyone knows, and yes, we actually have a screenshot for the, the year. That was, was uh, something that came up in Brian's talk this morning. So 1984. Um, where you can't trust any code that you do not completely you know, or totally create yourself. Uh, and so really what it comes down to is if you're going to install software, how do you trust it? And can you simply rely on the certificates, for example? Now this really comes uh, to be important when it comes to supply chain attacks. And there have been a lot of supply chain attacks that we can start to look at. SolarWinds is probably one of the biggest where uh, compromised developer certificate was actually used to insert malicious backdoors into the code. Uh, there have been other attacks looking at things like dependency confusion, uh, where someone will actually change the name or uh, have a package that has a very similar name, similar to typo squatting, or actually look at the difference between public and private repositories. You might have your own internal repository. You'd like that to have precedence, but it doesn't always happen. Uh, there could simply be vulnerabilities in the package managers or the repositories, and they can be compromised. Uh, there is things like protestware, where a developer actually turns malicious and changes that code. Uh, you know, there's the example here of the NPM package, where it actually wipes it. I remember historically there were Chrome extensions, where they would actually sell the extension to someone else, and then it would kind of turn malicious as well. And then the latest attack that we had to add to our slide is the C3X, which has the distinction of being a supply chain attack, which was caused by another supply chain attack. So there are a bunch of, uh, of ways in which the industry has attempted to uh, you know, protect the supply chain. And if we look at the standard pipeline, you've got, you know, you develop your code, you're then going to go and build it, you'll compile it, release it, and finally deploy it on your final end systems. And these all indicate key places in which you can actually put uh, different checks and add trust to the system. And there have been a number of projects that try to do this. You can add different security and vulnerability checkers on the development side. You can look at building integrity into the build system, uh, things like the Salsa project. You can do uh, you sign code uh, and create SBOMs so that when the final user has it, that they know they can actually trust it. But we know that this is not actually a perfect solution and there are different uh, vulnerabilities and exploits that can happen. So again, looking at solar winds, there's the leak certificates. Salsa requires, for example, two-person uh, uh, verification of any commit, which doesn't actually help with the proverbial one person in Kansas that's running a project. Uh, and it doesn't actually address how you handle things like legacy code or build environments that you might not have access to older systems, 10-year-old uh, environments that might still be around. Uh, can anyone actually get access to an older compiler, for example? And it also doesn't have, uh, handle the whole uh, uh, legacy code problem. So we live in worlds and environments. It's not all clean slate. We have lots of code that's been deployed. And we need to go back and figure out where that code is running and where it came from. Um, so I think earlier, I think Brian referred to this as you know, forensics. Uh, typically forensics, when I hear that term, I think of postmortem, and I'd actually rather view this as more of a pre-mortem. Can we use this tool to find out where software is deployed, where it came from before things potentially go bad? So what we're actually proposing is a way to do what we call software fingerprints, to actually gain assurance that code is what we think it is. And the easiest way to actually uh, express what we mean by this is with a few examples. So we have kind of a standard Git tree. 
And you can imagine you have a single version, and now I'm going to compile it. For example, two different operating systems, an Ubuntu operating system and RHEL. They might use different compilers, different optimizations, maybe different patches. And what we'd really want is to be able to have these two come up with the same fingerprint. We know it's not going to be the same hash, so the signatures aren't going to match. Uh, we were actually showing the SSD, which you would think would actually have some of these properties, but it doesn't, and we'll illustrate that a little bit later. Uh, but we would want this to kind of indicate that this is, you know, semantically the same code that's running. Similar, you'd actually want different versions to have a similar hash or a similar fingerprint. So if you have two different versions of a package that are off by, say, a small patch, you'd want to be able to identify that they are very, very similar and exactly where the two different pieces of code actually deviate and be able to then look into that. We also want stability across architectures. So you can have cases where you have x86-64, you can have PowerPC, you can have ARM, and we basically want to be able to assure that uh, across all these different architectures, it is the same binary. It's doing the same task, even though it was compiled differently. And then finally, we want this to be very, very robust so we can run it against all of our legacy systems. So this is something that the team's been working on for probably close to about 10 years, uh, some of them during their uh, PhD work. Uh, some of the original work uh, that I'd actually like to kind of mention is things like uh, work that Jiang had called Redebug, which is actually looking for vulnerabilities in software that might have been copied and pasted into other pieces of code. So you patch one, you don't patch the other. And here, having something like a fingerprint where you can detect all these different variants would be incredibly useful. Sigmal is kind of a seminal work looking at variants of malware, and we use some of the original ideas in that paper to create our fingerprint. Uh, but 2017, we actually started looking at Docker image vulnerability scanners and realizing that they all had, at least the ones that we looked at, a fairly fatal flaw where they relied on the metadata that was actually in the containers. And as a result, we couldn't trust the results that we were getting out of them because we would not want to view uh, uh, these images as being potentially compromised, potentially malicious, and don't want to necessarily trust what they're going to state is inside them. Kind of fast forward, because the project took a bit of a rocky start until 2021, when the gift that keeps on giving, Log4j, kind of reared its uh, ugly head. And IBM, like every other organization, had to scramble and figure out where do you have Log4j, where is it installed, which versions, and remediate them. And what we found is that most of the Log4j scanners had several deficiencies where they typically looked at, uh, they looked for packages with a, a very specific name. Do you have log4j.jar with a specific version? And what we found is that because of how lots of software is packaged, you know, Maven, you know, with dependencies, everything gets put into one, this, this would completely fail. You had lots of other third-party packages that would kind of embed it inside, and it was missing all these different instances. So we dusted off some of our old ideas, created the Code Genome Project, announced it at the uh, Linux Foundation Member Summit, and today we want to kind of give you a bit of a peek at what we've been doing since then and how it's uh, shaping up. So how does the Code Genome actually work? So how do we compute fingerprints? So what we want, again, are these semantically meaningful fingerprints. And so what you see here is four different versions of code that all compute the same function. They're different in how they might do inline assembly, they might do some light uh, obfuscation, they might add some additional functions or routines, but they're doing the exact same computation at the end of the day. So you can see the function, you can see the, uh, the machine code, but what we really want is them to come up with the exact same representation. And what we do is we canonicalize that into a single gene, like so. So we will able to take the original source code and we can either compile it and then lift it to IR or go right to an IR. And we'll canonicalize that. We'll apply different optimizations, uh, different uh, mutations on it to uh, come up with a single kind of representative uh, form of that code. And then we can apply the equivalent of like a fuzzy hashing function to get an embedding and that embedding becomes the gene. And we can do this at multiple levels of granularity. Uh, intermediate representation. So in, in the Code Genome Project, we use an LLVM IR. Uh, so the code, we can do this at different uh, levels of granularity. So I like to actually state that software distribution is just a turducken. We have archives filled with archives filled with other archives, and we have to continuously unpack them. 
So when we get a new file to actually analyze, like a, a Debian file, an RPM, a Docker image, whatever it might end up being, we start to recursively unpack that and find all the files that are inside of it until we find something that's actually an executable. From there, we can actually look at computing a gene across the uh, uh, different granularities, whether or not it's the entire file, a segment like the text segment or the data segment, or each individual function. And as we do this, we start to build up a graph of these different representations, and we can start making the connections. We have a package that has an archive inside of it that has files, they have functions, they have multiple genes, and so on. And then we can make connections. Which other functions share those same genes? Which files were they in? Which packages and archives were they in? And we can use this to then make a connection for something new that's unknown. If we have some ground truth information, what is it, where did it came from? And actually uh, track that back in time. And at the end of the day, we produce what we hope to be a very large, very complete knowledge graph of all the software, all the code, all the functions, where they came from and how they're used. And once we get this, we can hopefully do a lot of very interesting and very useful things. One might be vulnerabilities. So if you have a new vulnerability, you can identify what function was actually impacted and where that is. What other packages are using it? What other code is using it? Was it copy and pasted and so on? If you have some unknown code, we might be able to classify it. What is this code actually doing? Is it network code or crypto code, display code, compression code, things along those lines? And again, where is it actually located? We can then use this to do unknown package identification. In this case, this is, for example, wget. We can identify that. But if we have some threat intelligence information, we can say uh, not only is this potentially a vulnerability, but this was malicious code. This was code we saw in a piece of, uh, of malware. It was injected into a third-party application, distributed, and where else are we seeing that? So we can actually then hopefully find repeat attacks and different supply chain attacks. So I'm going to hand it over to Jiang, who's actually going to run through some of our core use cases and results. OK. Thank you, Ian. So of course, we are at the supply chain security conference. So we, of course, talk about the SBAM. So what is the relationship between the genome project and SBAM? And we think there is an opportunity using the genome to validate and verify the SBAM. And the problem we're trying to tackle is, of course, SBAM is a great format and great, great kind of the initiation to understand and describe about the dependencies and component of a specific software that can be provided vendor. But the issue is that, can you trust the SBAM? Because there could be a case, maybe the, the developer is not familiar with about all the SBAM format, maybe specifications, so they make a mistake. Or sometimes they did not have the full knowledge about the dependencies, or maybe dependencies, dependencies. Sometimes they may miss some of the dependencies, so meaning that it could be incomplete as well. Or some of the cases, especially commercial software, as you may kind of see some of the kind of the bracket talk or some other kind of the open source committee, it's not uncommon for some of the people trying to use some of the GPL code and inside their commercial product. And in that case, of course, there is strong motivation. They want to hide the dependencies because they don't want to get into the legal problem. So then how do we really verify SPAM you get from the vendor is really complete and the correctness. So that is the kind of the problem we're trying to tackle with the software genome project. And so then how we do that? So we first go out and look at the, some of the tools available out there. And of course, SBAM specification has been evolved over the time, different format, SVDX, Cyclone DX, all the communities there. And there are lots of great tools out there. And here, the slide is not tr to criticize some of the tools, but this is trying to understand where the potential gap might be. It's because as a security researcher like all of us, we need to think about where is the gap that might be exploited by the attacker. So if we're not carefully handling it. So for this case, we noticed that most of the SBOM generation tool, they rely on the metadata. And the metadata, of course, is great information that can be bootstrapped about all the information about the component. But the potential issue is that they can be easily manipulated. For example, on the left-hand side, when you build a Docker file, as you can see, it's quite simple Docker file. You're just spinning up the Ubuntu and you install wget. In the end, of course, you get the SBOM that includes wget. But on the right hand side, you see there is a move command, so which is basically technically removing the dpackage file from the Ubuntu. Of course, as you know, the apt get, whenever you do something, it will update the dpackage file. But what if you just remove the dpackage database, then result in, of course, empty database, and then now there is no metadata. 
So that's why there is no matching of the double get. So even though image has a double get or maybe some other program, it can easily, we can just kind of the hide the presence about it, or we can even manipulate it. And on the right hand side, we recently looked into the Go binary, and it happened to be the case because of some of the collaboration we have with some other friends. And so when you look at the Go binary, the interestingly, so Go, as you know, so it includes the most of the binary, and then they the also code dependencies and statically compile into giant one executable file. And the nice thing is there is a code, code section called the build information that contains all the dependencies it rely on when you build this specific software. This is great source to correct and the content co correct and then get the uh, build at the dependency information. The problem is that as you can imagine, you go hex edit, you just edit it, and now you suddenly have the different package name. So the problem is that metadata, we can use it, but still there need to need, we still need to verify whether this is the, actually the case or not. So that's the kind of the problem we trying to address. And recently, you may also see the same chart multiple times for some of the talks. So CISA also released a type of the SBAM. And they also think about there could be different type of SBAM depending on the which phase of software development life cycle. So most of the cases, we talk about the design source or the build because that's the where you can get exact the dependency about what software relies on which are the dependencies. So that is a great source and there is a great place to get it. But the problem is that when you go to the commercial software, probably as an end user or what kind of the developers, when you rely on some commercial software, you don't necessarily have the access to that phase. That means we have to rely on some other method, like analyze SPAM or deploy the SPAM. So meaning that from the actual the binary artifact you get from the vendor, so then it's a way to inspect and get the SPAM about it. So that's kind of the benefit we are trying to get from the software genome. So we are not relying on the actual source code, we analyzing the binary, the code itself, and then trying to get the SBOM out of it so that we can support, for example, the legacy code, which may, we may lose the access to actual source code, or some of the, the building environment, maybe it's 10 years old, it's hard to replicate it, so maybe we may don't, it's not easy to replicate or rebuild the process, but we still wanna kind of analyzing it and get the SBOM out of it. So, and when you look at the SBOM for binary, so we noticed that there could be multiple level of complexity and multiple level of the problem we may need to tackle. So we, I quickly talk about the metadata. So metadata is given from some software, it comes with it, it's nice to information, we can use it. That's kind of the one case zero. And then the other case would be equivalent packages. For example, this is a known RPM or Debian packages. If the hash is matching, of course we can just using it and then more complex case would be individual file. So for example, someone maybe grab some of the file from different packages and then create a new packages. Of course, now the package itself does not have any matched knowledge because the file has should be different, but we still want to kind of the tell about each individual file and so that we can kind of give information about what packages it might contain inside. And then that's the kind of file level of information. And then we can go one level further down, so from the package, file, and of course each of the file, it may contain multiple functions. The reason we are interested in what function is, as Ia mentioned, so there could be multiple level of granularity, we can inspect the software, but the function is naturally one kind of the self-contained kind of unit that represents some kind of computation by definition. So that's why we're focusing on the function level of granularity so that we can tell Specific file, maybe change it from maybe hash perspective, but individual function, how much is really changed from version one to two, so we can tell the specific difference. Is it changing some specific function, or is it specific maybe addressing some other vulnerability, so that we can tell that level of granularity and then to matching it. So of course, current SBOM is the handling the granularity at the file level, so that's why we're trying to kind of discussing with the other people, so what is the right level of granularity and how we want to represent this level, extra level of information. So that's the case three. If we go down a little bit more complex case, it would be this about not exact match at the function or the gene level, but there could be the some degree of similarity. For example, maybe 80% of similarity, how are we gonna tell it? So, because SBOM is about which package has which version, but it doesn't tell about the confidence level. So how you wanna capture this? This is something kind of up to the discussion, but this is kind of the different level of kind of complexity we're trying to discuss and trying to address. So as you can tell, so this is not, we don't have complete solution yet, but this is kind of the beginning about 
how we want to address from left to right so that we can have more detail and more control information so that we can provide the vendor and the developers and the users so that they can have uh, the, this, the informed decision about the package. So this is about the presentation. Now let's move on to the, some of the demo. And so first, so we are going to show the three demo and I think we have enough time to go through it. So first demo is about SBAM generation. So I'm going to show the what is the unknown IPM package contained. On the left hand side, you see the file tree. So inside it has a multiple file, multiple executable inside, and then we package as RPM. And then of course, when you're using some of the existing tool, of course, this is a new packages and there is no information. So most of the tool, not most of them. So all the tool we try, they couldn't generate it any of the SBAM because it's completely new. So we submitted to our code genome project and then we can get the SBOM and then what that we are, I'm gonna show in the next chart. And then we can show also the how this generated SBOM of course can be used for other SBOM analysis tools. Let me play some of the demo. So this is a UI of the code genome and team has been working on to improving the usability so that it can be quite intuitive to use by many of the people. So here from the UI, so we can upload the file to the, our UI. And then we select this unknown RPM. I just show the file tree and then we upload. And then it will start processing it behind the scene. And after several minutes after, it will come back with some of the analysis result. Kind of typical information about first, file name, file hash, file time, file size. And then obviously, whenever the RPM or some of the package file, we have to inspect inside. As I mentioned, the software packaging is kind of Tadokan. So we have to go down into the deep and then see what file is actually inside. And then from this identified all the executable, we generated Cyclone DX SBOM on the right hand side, as you can see. So this is full SBOM. Of course, I'm not going to scroll through all of them, but we can just easily download and then that can be used for ingested other tool, which I'm going to show in the kind of later part of the video. So, and this is middle of the screen. We show this kind of summary view, the table view about what kind of component we identify this unknown RPM and what are the version, what are the license, what are the package URS so that we can present about the information about the component. So this is quite useful information to highlight what is unknown RPM. And from the UI, one extra thing to kind of the we develop is for given some of the job, we can highlight which file was being successfully processed or could be failed so that we can do kind of helping the debugging about the processing because there could be multiple different type of files. So it brings a kind of different challenges. I'm, I'm going to the kind of the dependency track, the UI. So if we don't know about dependency track, this is one of the open source project that can be used to ingest, visualize about SBOM. And then also it can be connected to many open source intelligence so that if you have the multiple project and you ingest it as part about each of the project, it will also connect with open source intelligence like CVE and MBD or some of the kind of the package, NPM, those metadata. So it automatically connect the external intelligence so it highlight where the vulnerability is. So since we just downloaded this as part, I already created some unknown kind of the project and then I'm gonna upload this to new as part we just generated. And then if the format is not correct, of course, it's going to reject. But of course, we have the correct format of the Cyclone DX. And then it ingests it. And it highlights what kind of component inside these packages and what this SBOM is contained. Then showing the version and license. And in this case, it highlights one of the vulnerability. But the disclaimer is for demo purpose, we ingested kind of the one of the artificial intelligence, so that if we know about some open source intelligence, we can connect, but of course it's not representing the real vulnerability about this software. So this is demo one about generating the SBOM from the given the binary or the RPM packages, and then how it can be used to analyzing in other kind of the component, other analysis, the tools so that we can use this SBOM. Now let me move on to the demo two, which is about reproducible build. So earlier of the this day, earlier this of today, so there is another talk from the Red Hat to talk about the reproducible build. And of course, it's a really hard problem because there could be multiple factors that affect the final outcome of the binary. And reproducible build in the simple term, given the source code, if the source code is the same, it will result in the same binary. So they can be it can be used to verify the comparison process is not compromised. So it's a really great concept to verify there is no compromise about during the compilation process. And we think from the code genome, that this could be one way to approach this problem. So such that 
if those code is the same, the same source code, and compile, regardless of the compilation environment or the setup, we can generate the same gene. I think that's kind of the one of the approach we can handle or kind of the trying to solve this kind of reproduce or build problem. So I'm showing the kind of screenshot to compare two binary. And these are actually the same source code from binutil. In this case, help edit. This is kind of utility. And then we compile with a different option. Like one is compiled on the left-hand side that is compiled with O2. And on the right-hand side, it's compiled with O3 option. As you can see, the gene similarity is close to 100. And it's, in this case, it's 100. So that means these two files, even though they compile with different options, they result in the same gene. So we can tell, OK, these two binary looking different. And even though compiled differently, they actually come from the same source code. So that's we can tell about the kind of this binary. And more challenging case would be, in this case, this is core util and touch is of the binary. And the part is the source code, and we compile with for different architecture. On the left hand side, this is x86 64 bit. On the right hand side, that is compiled for ARM 64 bit. And of course, the binary is different. Even the architecture is different. We get the same gene, not the same gene. It's almost a similar gene, so that we can tell these are actually coming from the same. So at this phase, maybe you're curious about how the gene quality would perform across all these kind of challenging cases because we're talking about different platform, architecture, compiler, compiler's option. There are so many variations we need to handle. Of course, this is really challenging problem. If we, if we also work on the binary analysis, this is a really well-known problem studying for a decade. And we, we are claiming we have 100% accuracy, but we are working hard to get there. And then this chart showing where we stand and where we are going. So this graph is to showing about what kind of progress we are making it. So the data set, first let me describe about what kind of data set we use to generate this graph. So we use the core util, so, and core util, as you know, it has 105 different programs in it. And then we compile with, that we compile. We actually use the data set from the bin kit, the, the citation number four, and that compile with many different options. For example, five different architecture, x86, sorry, 2-bit, 64-bit, ARM, ARM 64-bit, and MIPS. And for it, they use the nine different compilers, four different versions of the CLang, and five different versions of GCC, and four different compilation. When you multiply these, you can tell this is 180 different combination. So meaning that each program, we have 180 different versions of the binary that compile in different combination of options. So as you can tell, this uh, binary, of course, coming from the same source code, but resulting in a very different format of the binary and of different architecture. So once we have all this binary, now what we did is we randomly select 250,000 positive pair, function pair, and 250,000 negative pair. And then we measured the accuracy of a different gene. So since we talk, why are we talking about different gene? Because we don't think there could be one single gene would be the best. And if you think about the file hash, there are multiple file hash. It could be MD5, SHA-256. SHA so we think there could be multiple genes that represent the, the program. And the different gene might be performed better for different use case. So that's why we are exporting multiple genes. In this case, we are comparing the different type of the fuzzy hashing. The first one, the blue one is SSD. As you know, this is kind of context where the fuzzy hashing is mainly used for text comparison. And here we are feeding the actual raw byte. Of course, it's really challenging for SSD and probably it's not the most intended way to use for SSD, but we tested as kind of, because SSD is one of the kind of the, the most well-known the, the fuzzy hashing, so that's why we tested it. And then it was kind of close to 50. That means it's kind of almost doing the random guessing. It's really hard to get the byte, byte level of fuzzy hashing using the SSD to get a good quality. And then we use the version zero, which Ian mentioned about early part of the presentation. So one of the team members who work on the malware analysis, he developed the, the, uh, the tool called Sigma, which is about the image level of representation of the byte code. So which turns out to be more robust than SSD, but still it's not giving the really good sense about the quality. So we also use the, the function sim search. This is actually the open source project from Google Project Zero, which is using the control flow analysis. So now from the byte code, what we are discussing is how about bring more program analysis technique to understand the software instead before applying the fuzzy hashing. So that's the kind of the idea about FSS, function sim search. So from the control flow graph, which is basically 
how the program is executing from the beginning and it's kind of the graph representation. And then they do the structural level of the fudge hashing and then do the mapping. And when measure the same data set, it of course bump up the accuracy from the simple image processing. Now we're using the program analysis, it accuracy goes up a little bit. But still, of course, we want to improve more because we still want to have the 100% goal. And what we did is, as Ian mentioned in the early part of the demo, now we're using the IR, which is about intermediate representation that is kind of handling different, we can apply architecture agnostic kind of optimization so that we can handle many different variation so that the result is the bump up almost 90%. So which is quite good improvement, just simple fudge hashing without requiring any kind of training. So we can, we can achieve this. But see, as you can tell, we are not at the 100% level yet. So that means there's still room to we can improve the program analysis. And at the same time, so there are two in today's talk, you probably heard lots of AI development or foundation model. So another kind of direction we are looking into is, is the better way to embed the knowledge we have. So that's kind of the direction we consider to go up kind of the more the accuracy boost up. So that's kind of the team is currently handling it. And this is, as you can tell, still the research and this is kind of work in progress. But I think with the current progress is already quite good enough to tell some of the differences. The last tip is uh, I'm gonna show the demo is, this is actually about, as you may remember, there's heart bleed, the vulnerability, and then we grab the two version of the heart bleed before and after this patch and we compile it. On the left hand side, this is a before the patch. On the right hand side, this is a after the patch. And then we compile. And then as you, I'm not sure whether you can see, so both of the program resulting almost 5,000 genes. So that means almost close to 5,000 function. And then we are able to compare and tell actually these five or six, seven, the functions are only the difference between two. So that means given the two consecutive version of the change of the binary, and we can tell what was the change and then we can inspect this change was expected or not. For example, the developer know this is secret patch or something, the change they mentioned and they intended, and then we can compare the binary level and then see whether the change is actually made at the right level of right function or not. If not, that means something can happening in the, during the compilation process. So someone need to kind of the, take a deep into it about what is the problem or what, what, what went wrong during the compilation process. And in this case, one disclaimer is actually the function change was made for hot bleed. There's only two function. So that was the third and fifth function. But then we see the more because some of the function rely on the global variable and that was a result in the change between the two binary. So as you can, as I, as I mentioned, this is kind of work in progress of the project. So we're trying to address kind of the how to find out and minimize some of the variation that can be caused by different compilation. So that's something we're trying to improve over the time. And then, and as it, and this, but this is already showing the way, this is already good enough to show and highlight what are the difference between the two versions so that we can pinpoint where to look at it. So this is the last chart. And at the current status, we currently support different browsers, different type of the binaries like Elpo Linux binary or Windows P file or Mac OS Arco binary. So these are something we are handling it. And in terms of architecture and six different architecture, we are currently supporting packages, well-known Debian and RPM packages and a whole lot of different archive. It's basically the kind of the unpeeling the onion to get to the actual the file content. And then we build this whole platform and in the cloud native manner so that we can boost and we can also handle many different files in a scale up manner. Otherwise, it's really hard to scale up and handling the, that many of the file. And also we are building the knowledge graph behind the scene. That's gonna be the kind of ultimate knowledge we can tell about each of the binary. And then we already showed the two different versions of the genome we are making it. And we actually kind of improving the next version of the gene so that we can bring more at the accurate gene representation. And of course, we are also populating more data into the knowledge graph and then to tell more about the, the, the software. As a next step, we're trying to integrate this kind of part of the build process so that we can verify during the build process, is this the right package or is this the right one to include or not so that we can tell what, what went wrong or the weather, where is correct or not. And also another part is the Goreng provide the kind of the different level of complexity and the darker images. Of course, images top file so we can easily handle it. 
But the issue is that the ARCO file, as you can think, is kind of almost like entire OS system. So that means that it contains huge number of files. If you think about Ubuntu, Debian, it's kind of base images. So that brings a different level of scalability problem. So that's something we are trying to handling. And then we actually plan to limit this service launch so that uh, we can it can benefit the community so that they can upload their file and they verify what kind of SPAM they can get it and then they can do the comparison about the two different version of the file. And then one of one of requests, of course, we had to the community is we want to hear about the feedback, whether this is useful or not, whether this is something you guys could be interested in joining, and then to developing maybe improving the gene quality or maybe the feeding more data. Maybe there could be more interesting use cases you're facing maybe during your day-to-day -day development. And so we want to hear about the insight and kind of feedback uh, about this project. So this will be the end of the presentation, and we are happy to take any questions. So the question was how to map from binary to the original source code. So at the moment, so we are keeping, we ingesting the trust, the source of the data, like from Debian, Ubuntu repository. So that's we get the actual the binary gene and their associated metadata. And if we have the source code, of course we can build and then generating the gene. And that information we can capture in the knowledge grab as kind of the link between this source code was actually used for generating this binary. So those kind of the relationship will be captured in our knowledge graph. Uh, I was going to ask, would you be able to give some insights into uh, performance aspects of this analysis and how long it takes to analyze, uh, let's say, a 10 megabyte tarball or something like that? That's a really good question. And to be honest, we don't have really good number to say yet because as you can imagine, this research project back and forth, changing improvements so here and there. So there's a kind of data point, unknown RPM reprocessing that was almost 200 kilobyte of the RPM, but inside, of course, when you unpack it, I forgot how many files, what was the size, but in the end, it was processing within four minutes to pro fully process in our pipeline to generate and, and to the, generate the result. You want to say something? Yeah, we can. Yeah, so you, you can kind of imagine, we, we made the explicit comment about scalability and decreasing cost. Um, there were a few versions of this where we turned into an Amazon meme and have gone through and made a lot of improvements and optimizations there. So the other kind of interesting aspect of this is the long tail distribution of the size of files. So standard RPMs, you know, a couple megabytes, we can handle those. But as they become larger, it becomes more difficult to actually do the decompilation, to like lift it back up into an IR. And so we kind of have to figure out, you know, where is that inflection point? Um, What's the average? And I don't think we can kind of give you a, oh, it's, you know, two minutes per, per megabyte. And I keep asking the team, you know, what's the dollar per gigabyte in which we're actually processing? So it's a little bit tricky to, to answer because of that, and we might need to kind of amortize by functions and then kind of do the regression. So that's still something we're trying to work on. But good question. One thing that I'm curious about, uh, um, which, uh, what kind of, of uh, uh, target uh, you're imaging for this product? Uh, like, who is going to use these like distributors to verify before they distribute, or uh, somebody before them, uh, auditors, uh, and also who should be feeding the a potential <coughs> database of genomes, for example, so that they can be trusted uh, to be truthful. Are you gonna oh, All right. questions get oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Uh, great question. So we have a couple of models that we're considering. So one that we actually kind of think makes sense is, you know, standing up a public service um, as kind of a public service. 
uh, which is a very large database, like a graph database that contains all this information. And we would have to seed that, kind of going to the question is asked, with some of the ground truth information. How would people use it? Well, there could be any number of ways in which you could actually use it. I mean, for us, you know, research, for threat intelligence, um, anyone who wants to kind of verify a binary bef or a dependency before they kind of ingest it. So DevOps shops could actually use it. We thought about, you know, do you integrate this into your package manager so it kind of does a check? It might be a little bit heavy, but, you know, we're, we're looking at some of these different use cases where someone might want to do it. So, we're, you know, if uh, people have, you know, ideas and they say, hey, you know, something like this is great and here's how I would use it, we'd love to hear that. Yep. Oh, okay, before I answer, sorry. So if I add to the question is, of course, supply chain is one of the problem and we want to tackle, but at the same time as Ian kind of presented before, so there could be those many several use cases. And of course, validation of the package is one thing, but eventually what we're trying to do is understanding software so identify maybe some of the kind of unknown packages, what this package is doing, there is more like SBAM related one. But first and third would be the another interesting angle when you discuss about some of the people. Okay, so you have the knowledge grab and of course we're feeding the benign software and then all the kind of the goodware. But what if we're just feeding to the malware? Could be to some kind of the state agents, kind of the malware, and then we're feeding it and then we can kind of the make a link whether this kind of the package or the file was kind of the coming from. So we can kind of trace back about this file was actually used for many different campaign or maybe shared with maybe some of the component with the benign software or not. And also some of the interesting would be, so there could be the kind of one vulnerability found in one of the packages, but the same vulnerability may be used for many different undocumented packages. So we want to kind of find out or kind of expand the knowledge to find out other vulnerability. So there could be many different internet use cases, but again, I think we open to hear about all the feedback, potential interesting use case or the challenges so that we can try to adapt and how to uh, use this better, in a better way. Um, my question is, is this something that could potentially be used to like enhance SBOMs where data, metadata is missing or like by cross verifying, cross checking somehow? Um, is that a use case or? Yeah, so you can imagine you get an SBOM, it says, hey, I've got, uh, here's a package, it contains these four things. Trust me, I signed it. Yeah. You know, Ken Thompson, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't really trust uh, many other people. I want to be able to verify. I want to rip it apart and figure out what's inside of it and kind of confirm that myself. I want to know that multiple compilers are producing something that are, that's effectively the same. So. Okay, and then is this open sourced? N not yet. That is something that is being discussed at the moment. So regarding the open source aspect, so it's one thing the team is discussing is what is the best way to benefit the community? Because this is, we at least we believe this is going to be helping the open source security and could be providing much more in interesting intelligence out of the software. But as you can tell, it requires a huge knowledge grab. And that means someone or some organization needs to spin on maintain the quality of the knowledge grab, which is going to be a huge task. So that's why I think we are kind of the opening up the discussion and the question and whether what is the best model and to benefit the community and what is the proper way to come uh, kind of the building and extending the quality of the paper quality of the, this project like the gene quality measurement something we presented so gene called better gene of course we can do the more interesting mapping and the collection correlation but then it also requires a knowledge grab how we can build and also the quarry in a more scalable manner i think these are also kind of the interesting question and i think Open sourcing is one way, but how we want to kind of the proper maintain about the entire service because probably a single person would not afford spinning up the huge knowledge graph. So that means there needs to be some form of centralized kind of the community effort to kind of support. So have you looked at any like big thing about how to like that kind of instance for people to use if they're not? Do you want to comment? Yeah. 
uh, <clears throat> I got a, a bit of a clarifying question and then a follow-up question for that. Um, in the in the in the results where you had the comparison on the gene, um, uh, was that comparison uh, gene equivalency or the five tiered thing? And like I'm kind of curious, like how much of it was gene equivalency versus a similarity? Um, and I'm so curious on like. Yeah. To, to answer this, so we picked the 250,000 positive function pairs and 250,000 negative function pairs, and then we generating the different genes and then whether they are matched or not. So if we match, and of course, if it's negative, that means we are correct. And of course, gene is matched 100%, and if it's positive, then we are correct. So that's how we measure the accuracy. So this is equivalency, right? Yeah, equivalency. Okay, cool. Um, for the similarity function, is like, is it something that's easy to kind of index or you have to kind of go through each one and do the comparison? So, okay, so one is, I guess there could be multiple level results. One is about the exact match of the gene or the thing. That is what we tested here. So to measure the, what is the real quality we can get out of it. And then another angle, interesting angle would be the most similar cases. It may not be 100% match, maybe 99% of the match. It's more like a nearest neighbor search. For that, KG is a good way to explore to find in the match. But still, of course, you can explore the entire knowledge graph for every single query to find out the nearest neighbor. So for that, we are using the mirrors as kind of vector database to indexing it. So that help about finding the nearest neighbor. So given the vector representation of the gene, what is the closest one so we can find it in a scalar manner. So that is something we are using it on top of the KG. Okay. Uh, cool. this is, I was just asking this because I, like, I, I imagine like if you could evaluate the genome on individual functions and then have them be kind of like packaged with the delivery of like the binaries and stuff like that, then like you wouldn't, anyone could do it by themselves and kind of like construct parts of the graph and evaluate it as well. Um, so then you don't necessarily have to like centralize it that way. That's good then, yeah, good comment, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so can you go back to the graph, the slide of graph bar? Because I, I'm quite of puzzled about what happens that it's the first analysis of the gene that is coming from the package that is, has the backdoor. So we don't have any reference before that, and the first one that you get is the backdoor one. How actually can tell that this package is backdoored? So, yeah, so it, I think it relies on the quality of the knowledge graph. If it is something we never seen before, of course, we cannot tell exactly what this code is, but of course, we can tell wh what is similar to some other known genes. But of course, if you're looking for the exact match, if it's completely new code, yes, we cannot tell. That, that would also imply that it's a, a tactic that you've never seen. So no piece of malware has done a, a task that is similar to that one. So. There, there tends to be some similarity between, you know, different ways of, of producing the same malicious function. So we rely on that. And the hope is that as the graph, the knowledge graph in the database grows and it gets denser, that the likelihood that we wouldn't have similar matches and be able to then track them back to what they, what they do and where they came from will actually go down over time. Uh, if you go back to the embedding slide, I think two slides before this one. So, so which uh, one? More, th th this one. The embedding function, is it semantics? So for example, if I have a function that uh, shells to curl and another one that shells to wget, will the embedding be similar? This embedding part, we are using the one of the, our colleagues, the previous work called Sigma. So we actually get the machine code, if did IR to canary correlation, bunch of the LIBM IR paths to optimizing it. So, so the, the goal is that we can minimize the difference at the program analysis level. And then once you get the big code, we simply represent the kind of the big vector image, and then we embedding into different kind of the vector representation so that we can kind of do the comparison. So this is, as you can tell, it's kind of a simple kind of vector kind of transforming. So 
this is a part we're trying to explore many different type of the embedding so that we can kind of improve the law of series, as you can tell. So semantic preserving or kind of the more complex way or is there kind of better projection, processing it. So that's kind of the part we're trying to address. As you can tell from here on the left hand side, we're trying to bring the knowledge about program analysis, software engineering community. And on the right hand side, we're trying to leverage AI community, what kind of embedding or the method. In this case, we have the bit code and the image, but there could be control flow, data flow, so there could be graph representation of IR itself as kind of the quote unquote language, and could be the adaptable model we can use it. So this is kind of the parallel kind of the, the, the development we're currently exploring. Do you want to add? Yeah. Add one question. Um, or one thing this. So when we actually look at this, it is kind of a pipeline. And there are key areas where we can see improvements and key things where, you know, tomorrow I want to re rip this part out and redo it and get, you know, the fourth generation genome. So we know there's some issues with, you know, lifting to IR from different tools or ways and people have evaded that. So we've looked at different tools to make that more robust. The canonicalization, so as Jiang said, you know, leveraging from the, the optimization, the compiler community. There's probably a lot of work that we can do there that would get better canonical forms. Um, the actual embedding itself is another area where we, we, we have, you know, some very concrete ideas of what to do there. And then there's one thing that we do on top of that, which is then realigning or regrounding the, the embeddings. So even here, when we use the, the existing approach, which we actually have gotten a surprising amount of lift from, from that, given how simple it was, we were able to then like reground that with small numbers of samples, and that gave a three to four to, you know, uh, bump in AUC from just a very, very simple realignment. Um, and that was a little bit surprising. And I know John kind of mentioned that there are different uh, like subclasses of this from, you know, it's the same architecture compiler, but you know, you only change the bitness going from 32 to 64 architecture. And for some of that, we got more. For others, we got less. But so we kind of pinpointing the, the places in which we can actually make optimizations. Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was thinking something like word to vec for the code genome. So. Yes. Um, yeah, very, very much so. Everyone is jumping on the foundation model bandwagon, and you know, IBM is, is no different there. I guess while you pass the mic, the, the issue with like the, you know, word to vac, uh, ASM to vac, things like that, is it actually misses this middle layer. So we had considered that originally, but it, it misses like all these different optimizations that you could actually do. So it doesn't, didn't directly address some of the, the issues, but. Did you have a follow-up? Got time for, I think, five, uh, seven minutes left before we're at the top of the hour. Yeah. Any final questions? So have you tried to do any tests on uh, codes that actually you, in the terms of compilation, it's altered the code, but still the same. Let's say open SSL when, when you need to do an export control and uh, take away parts of the code and the, the resulting binary comes without plugins or other parts. And then, for example, when you export to China, it needs to cut down some, some algorithms and it goes to other parts there. So it's basically the same code, same architecture, but then with different Parts build of the compilation. We haven't done that, <clears throat> but I imagine it would be an interesting thing to do. Um, and we could probably do it, you know, shortly. And I, it'd be interesting to see if it fits or non fits, you know, that type of thing. Um, but what we would expect is that the functions that don't match, we'd be able to identify, hey, this is what's been ripped out and this is what's been added potentially, this is what's been changed. So where you actually, you know, where you'd make that switch to call a function that is no longer there, that would change by some small amount. The functions you've removed, they're obviously not going to have any matches. So I would imagine it would look similar, uh, something like that, but we have not done that test yet. Looks like it's time for uh, closing remarks. Okay. Um, didn't have any closing remarks, but I, I know there are a couple of people. <laughs> yeah. There are a couple of people. I'll, I'll go to the, the final so slide. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I will say this, you know. Our interest, if people are interested and want to, you know, pressure us into open sourcing it, you know, if you have a compelling reason to do that, you know, there are a few of us here, you know, Jeff is here, who's, I think, been encouraging us in the past. 
Um, we, need, we need to have that compelling reason to do it. I think it's there. Um, but we'd love to talk to people about how we might be able to use this, collaborate on it. And then there is that, that question, you know, is it a big service? It's going to be expensive to run. So how do we do that? Um, is it open source? Is it, you know, some distributed uh, architecture? So very, very interested in, in collaborating and talking. Well, just before you applaud, I'll just say I, I, I did hear VMware asked if this was going out in open source, so that's one request. If uh, anyone else wants to come up and talk to me about their interest in seeing this go into open source, that would be fine. But um, uh, okay, there's a couple more. So um, uh, yeah, because uh, I want to just. Uh, recognize the hard work that uh, these two and some others in IBM research as well as uh, others in the past other projects that have kind of laid a foundation for this so as you uh, do a little round of applause I just want to add my thanks to uh, Zhang and uh, Ian in this uh, capacity so great job you guys thank you